Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Too loud? Oh, what just happened? Let's go back. Okay. So thanks for having me. I've, um, I've given presentations about this work at the Occlutna Glacier a lot of times over the last few years, and I've never been able to do this at one of my talks before, so I'm going to do it now. Bartender, can I have a bourbon? <laughs> There's actually no one behind the bar right now, but I do have a token. Maybe it'll happen. We'll see. It'll be a first. So um, I am a professor at APU, and um, I guess the, the, the title of this talk that I'm going to present to you today is a little bit tongue-in-cheek because, um, and, and actually... This was, I, I suggested this title to the organizers of this fine event, and they thought it was too elitist that many of you might not have hot tubs. So I'd like to start with a poll. How many people here have a hot tub? Good. Okay. Those are the elites in the crowd. Oh, one of the people that rejected the title actually has a hot tub. <laughs> She's apparently confident in the... Uh, I don't really. Yeah, okay. Anyway... Um, I actually think sea level rise is a bigger deal. But as you may or may not know, Occlutna Glacier feeds water to Occlutna Lake, and Occlutna Lake is the source of most of the water for the city. And uh, I've been studying with my students at APU the glacier, the rivers that come out of it, the lake, the hydrology of that system for some time. And uh, I want to share with you the results of that and, um, and talk about, in fact, a little bit sea level rise and a little bit about the water supply and, and it turns out the power supply and some of the related things. So we're gonna go there. I tried to include some photographs. This is a, a former student of mine, Louis Sass, traveling up in the uh, east branch of the Occlutna Glacier there. It's a pretty place, not the least of the reasons why I study glaciers. So this is just a little outline where we're gonna go with this. So what? Why do we care about why glaciers melt? We're going to talk about the Occlutna Glacier. <laughs> well, <laughs> believe me, I need that every time I give a talk, but it just never happens. Okay, we're going to talk about the glacier for those of you who aren't familiar with it and what's happening to it, and then the river, the water that comes out of the glacier, and then, and then we'll come back to the hot tub for those few of you who came just for that reason. Okay, quick primer on glaciers. I'm assuming uh, you all being here in Alaska that you kind of know what they are. Uh, this will probably be a little bit review for some of you, but um, basically we have here a little cross section of a glacier. See that? Oh, yeah. Um, and as you might suspect, it's cold and it snows a lot up in the mountains at the top of this glacier. It's warmer and it doesn't snow as much down in the lower elevations. And the way that glaciers work is that it snows so much up there that during the summer it doesn't all melt away. There's still some snow left over at the end of summer. And so that snow year after year after year piles up. And if you do that for long enough, that snow has to go somewhere. So it flows downhill. And it flows downhill into uh, what my former advisor would say, into harm's way. It flows down into a, a part of the landscape where snow is not as welcome, where the snow melts during the summer or the ice melts during the summer. And so, so we have this, uh, let me see if I can get there, what we call a zone of accumulation. That's where we're snowing more than it melts. And then it's carried by glacier flow down into this kind of fancy word, the zone of ablation. And that's where that excess material melts away because during the bulk of the summer, the ablation zone, there's no snow there at all. It's just the ice that was carried downstream by the flow of the glacier. Okay, and how do glaciers change in response to climate? Well, it either gets warmer or colder, the temperature changes, or it snows more or less. And if you change either of those two variables, the temperature or the snowfall, you're gonna change the size of the glacier because the size of these two zones is gonna change, the accumulation zone and the ablation zone. And of course, we live in a time when the main kind of change that we see is that the temperature is rising, 
precipitation changes a little bit as well, but it's not as big a factor as the temperature, and so most glaciers are shrinking. The ablation zone is getting smaller, and the glacier is retreating, uh, becoming smaller. Stop me, I don't know what the format of this, I, I haven't been here before, but I suspect it's okay for me to say ask questions if you have any. Great. Whoa, it's sensitive. Okay, so uh, that's how glaciers change in a nutshell. So um, I wanna tell you, they do change and they're almost all shrinking. I want to give you one example and then show you some data. So this is Glacier Bay. Anyone, anyone been to Glacier Bay? Yeah, a few of you. Not the same people as with the hot tubs. <laughs> I see how you spend your money. Yeah, going on, going on a travel. So this is the, the fjord just downstream of the Muir Glacier. And I just want you to know that, that right there is where, when the topographic map of the Muir Glacier was made, which was just in the 1950s, that's where the terminus of the glacier was. Everything in this photograph, from here back upstream, everything in the foreground, everything in the background, you can't even see the glacier anymore. It's not even in the picture. That was all under ice. And that's only about 50 years, okay? So you can go to places like this. This is a, a dramatic example of glacier shrinkage. It's to make a point, but yes, question. Great question. When he came through, which I don't know the exact date, but that would be early 1800s, does that, or maybe late 1800s, but 1800s, this terminus that I just described in 1950 was about another, I'm guessing a little bit, 40 miles downstream. So the glacier was much, much, much bigger at that time. And even in the last 50 years, it's, it's done this dramatic retreat. So yeah. Um, I think the camera would be, have been submerged in ice at that time for sure. Yeah, yeah. would have been. A, yeah. When people ask questions, in case people on the first time really can't hear what you're saying, repeat. Okay, so the, the thing is, is that this is just one glacier, right? And maybe not all the glaciers are doing the same thing. So just a little bit of data to sort of emphasize the point that this is a statewide, and I could show you more data to show that it's a worldwide trend. These are the glaciers, uh, sorry, these are the parks in Alaska, national parks, that are glaciated. Antiakchak, Denali, Gates of the Arctic, Glacier Bay, Katmai, Kenai Fjords, Klondike Gold Rush, Lake Clark, and Wrangell St. Elias. What I'm showing you is at the time that the topographic maps were made, which was in the 1950s, how much ice was there in kilometers squared? Just the total part of the map that was covered in ice about 50 years ago, compared to what it is, sat means satellite. So in, in, if we take a remote sensing image, a satellite picture from the last few years, and look, map the ice there, how has it changed? And all I want you to notice is that every single park, which represents many thousands of glaciers, th this particular plot covers about 7,500 glaciers. And what you see is, in every park, Overall, the amount of ice has declined. Okay, so the glaciers are shrinking. This isn't a surprise to anyone except for like half the people that vote for president every year. So, um, you know, if anyone has a question now, you know, is it really true? But yeah, the glaciers are shrinking. So, so what? Why do we care about that? Well, there's two kind of classes of reason I want to talk about. One is global, the global sort of picture of glacier shrinkage and then the local one which I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. So global sea level rise, some of you maybe in that trivia contest got the answer right. Just to illustrate the point that when glaciers change their volume, when they grow or shrink, it affects sea level. If you look at this picture right here, that's what North America looked like at the height of the last ice age. That was about you know, 21,000 years ago. That's a big glacier covering Canada. Hockey was at a really repressed stage <laughs> 21,000 years ago. When those glaciers melted away, and it didn't happen overnight, it took 
over 10,000 years, but when they melted away at the end of the Ice Age, and of course all the other glaciers elsewhere on the planet, sea level rose 110 meters. That's 70% of the Earth, that's a lot of water. And, and it just illustrates a point really well, I think it's kind of an astounding number. But when glaciers melt, the sea level changes in response to that. And there's, a, there's a very direct link, linkage between the two. Now, we're not looking at those kind of changes right now, thank goodness. Even Anchorage would be, I'm not even sure. How high is the highest house on the hillside? Anyone know? An elevation? A couple thousand feet, okay. So the people with the hot tubs would still be okay if sea level rose 110 meters, but, but none of the rest of us would. So it's a good thing that's not what we're looking at in the future. What we're looking at here is the last 300 years up to about the present, and then about a, about a, I don't know, at this point, I guess it's 90 or 87 years of projections for what sea level rise is gonna do. And, and, and this is what it comes down to. It's rising about three millimeters a year right now. Doesn't sound so bad. By the end of the century, the forecast suggests, this is the latest predictions, half a meter to 1.2 meters. So, you know, a foot, a couple feet, a few feet. Not a big deal if you don't live in Bangladesh or a lot of other places we could name, but sea level rise is a big deal for a lot of people that live on coasts, especially low-lying coastlines. That's not all glacier shrinkage. Some of that is from the ocean warming up and expanding, but about a third of it, a quarter to a third of it, is from glaciers melting. So, so as a global citizen, that's why we care. If a Klutna glacier and the other glaciers are shrinking, we care about it because of sea level rise. But those of us who don't have hot tubs still have faucets, and we have electrical appliances, and at the local level, there's these other reasons to care about glacier shrinkage. So this is a Klutna Lake right here. A Klutna Lake is fed by the Klutna Glacier. 80% of the water supply for this city comes from a Klutna Lake, and about 15% of the electricity for this city comes from a Klutna Lake. Okay, so that's, a, that's kind of a big deal for our city, and when the main source of water for that city is changing, we need to sort of ask ourselves, is that an issue or not? And that's sort of the question I want to raise today at the local level is, is, is this a big deal or not? It clearly is at the global scale, but, but when we think about just a Klutna Glacier, should we be worried? Okay. There is one more reason that I'll just mention briefly. It's not trivial for why we should care, and that is recreation. Anyone here skied the Klutna Traverse? Any hands up? All right, awesome. When did you do it, sir? 20 years ago, okay. I was, yeah, it's changed a lot. This is from uh, two years ago. It's actually getting really hard to get on the glacier now because it used to come down to this nice flat kind of a gravel bar here and you could just ski right up it. But actually last year it was right up to about there. And these are kind of, they don't look like much. It's not like uh, in the movies, but they're actually pretty steep bedrock cliffs kind of covered in loose rocks. It's getting hard to get on it. It's also getting really tiresome at the end of the day to hike up to one of the Mountaineering Club of Alaska huts that are placed next to these glaciers, if any of you have been to those. They built them in the 60s right next to the glacier, but the glacier has shrunk so much that you finish skiing after a day of skiing and, 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 the, and the hut's way up there above the glacier. And it's a sad, lonesome hike back to the hut after a day of skiing. It's one way that you can really see the effects of the glacier changing. So I don't think that's trivial. We all live in Alaska. Well, I don't know why everyone lives in Alaska, but I live in Alaska because I like playing in the mountains and hanging out on the glaciers and that recreation is changing. Oh, bad weather, right, okay, still gonna suck. Yeah, <laughs> even as the climate changes, so you're good. Okay, okay so, so what's happening to the glacier? You know, what can we conclude from that? Well, uh, briefly I wanna mention that all the work I'm showing, all the results that I'm gonna describe are, are based upon the work of my um, minions, I like to call them. 
one of whom is in the audience, but he's not a minion. He's a noble fellow. <laughs> but, but we've been doing research on the Eklutna Glacier for a number of years, and I started this work as sort of an opportunity for the students and for myself to use the local glaciers as a classroom. That's what APU is all about. That's what we've been doing. So as I'll mention a few other times in the talk, a lot of this is, is work that's been done by students at APU, which I think is great. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the place, this is the watershed of Eklutna Lake, all outlined in red. There's the lake. This is the East Fork. Has little tiny baby glaciers in it. This is the kind of glaciers they get excited about in California and Washington. This is the Eklutna Glacier in the West Fork Basin. This is the, when we say the Eklutna Glacier, that's the one we're talking about. So the Eklutna Glacier, it's, its watershed, the West Fork, is about half ice, this zone right here. The East Fork is just 13% ice. By Alaskan standards, actually for the first few years of this study, we called it the unglaciated watershed, and then someone pointed out that that was not true, that those glaciers are glaciers, so we count them now. And then, of course, there's all the water that comes down to the lake with no glacier. The outputs, where does all the water go? Well, all the water, 100%, goes to you. No water goes out of that lake unless they make a mistake, which sometimes happens. Every drop of that lake is used by the city. About 11% of it is used for our water supply. That gives us our 80% of our water supply, but 11% of the water that comes into the lake. And then hydropower takes all the rest. Okay, so, so we use everything in that lake. If it changes at all, it matters because the city uses it all. So how are things changing? Well, the sweatshop, this is where I get the students involved, load them up with 80 pound packs, have them dig really deep snow pits at the head of the glacier to figure out how much snow accumulated over the winter. OSHA might not approve of this situation right here, but uh, we haven't had any problems yet. So that tells us how much snow is accumulated over the winter, then we leave these things. This is our um, Iwo Jima photo. This is called an ablation stake. You put that out, and then you um, come back at the end of the season, and you see how much melt has occurred because you can measure how much of the stake has been exposed by melt. So we put a few of these out around the glacier. We come back, and then we have our measurements of how much accumulation occurred, how much ablation occurred. I have a question about that. Yep. The question was, is there a reason why we don't paint them red or something? Um, yeah, yeah, right, paint fades. <laughs> yeah, well, they're silver, they're aluminum. Um, uh, we just, yeah, we, have, we don't paint them because we've never had a hard time finding them. Yeah, we use GPS and it uh, works out. Okay, so summarizing a bunch of years of work, what is this thing? This is telling you basically has the Eklutna Glacier grown or shrank each year since we started the work. Five years, 2008 to 2012, and this is showing what I'm calling the annual balance. This is just a measure of whether the glacier grows or shrinks each year. And the units from minus two to 1.5, negative positive, zeros dashed, are it's kind of a weird thing, but once you get it, it's easy to visualize. Has the glacier, if you took all of the amount of snow and ice that either accumulated on the glacier that year or was lost to melt, and you just melted it like it was a swimming pool, how deep would the pool be? Did you fill up the pool a certain number of meters or did you sh drain the pool a certain number of meters? So it's an average over the whole glacier of how much water we added or lost and if you care about water, that's a good measure. And what you can see is that there's been actually a couple positive years. 2012, anyone remember that winter? Yeah. yeah, that was the winter I got surgery on my foot and was on crutches the whole winter. As a skier, I deeply resent the positive mass balance year that a Klutna Glacier had. It was a really good year for glaciers. And in fact, in 2008 it was too, but 2009 was a really warm year. Anyone else remember what else happened in March of 2009? 
Mount Readout erupted. Thank you, Johns. Put a bunch of ash on the glacier, and it melts even faster. So that was a very negative year. So what does this tell us? It tells us that every year is different. It's hard to really make a lot of conclusions from it. So this red line, that's the overall balance of the Eklutna Glacier. But the blue line here is the overall balance at a nearby glacier, the Wolverine Glacier down by Seward. Here's just the two of them plotted on a 50-year scale. There's our little short puny record for the Eklutna Glacier. But notice how nicely it fits with the Wolverine, which has been monitored thanks to the US Geological Survey for 50 years. And you're looking at the cumulative balance measured over time of the Wolverine Glacier. And we would argue that that's a pretty good proxy for what's been happening at the Eklutna Glacier. So for the last five years, it's been pretty variable, but Eklutna Glacier has been shrinking. For the last 50 years, we can't be certain, but it looks like based on the record of Wolverine Glacier that it's been shrinking. And then here's the 100-year perspective of Eklutna Glacier's change. I'm not sure with this remote how I'm going to make this happen, but I think it's going to work. This is a photo taken in 1915. That's the terminus of the Eklutna Glacier. I think even our esteemed ski mountaineer in the audience wasn't around at that time to try out the, the Eklutna Glacier, but it was easy to get on it then. Let's look at a photo taken about 100 years later from the same spot. There it is. Yeah. I didn't even mention when we were talking about recreation, the bushwhacking that's necessary to get to it. So 100 years, glaciers shrinking. So the picture is pretty consistent over the last 100 years, even shorter time scales. What's happening? The Eklutna Glacier has gotten smaller. It's not a surprise, but that's one of the things we wanted to document. OK, so what's that doing to runoff, meltwater? Well, uh, another subset of APU students have been working hard at answering that question, monitoring the river. This is Nathan Bosch, another graduate student, enjoying the, 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 the pleasures of the lakeside trail with a uh, bike trailer full of river monitoring gear. There's Anne-Marie Larkier, uh, another APU graduate student, monitoring river flow in the uh, shoulder season, there's Louis Sass again, um, doing some sort of gymnastic move, installing automated river logging equipment so that we can go home and keep measuring what the rivers are doing. So this is the kind of work we're doing on the rivers. Okay, data. Several years worth of river flow over the melt season. May to October, we've got different years, but this doesn't really mean anything to anybody, right? except for the handful of geeky scientists that want to look at it. So let's just ignore that, shall we? Even though it was really hard work to get it. I'm just going to focus on one year of data. If you remember 2009, this is our mass balance record. And I'm reminding you here that this was a year when the glacier melted a lot. It shrank a lot. There's the river for fun. And what I'm showing you here on this plot is a measure. Remember the West Fork, the red one. That's the one with the big old glacier. The East Fork, the black one, is the one we call non-glacial, even though it has some little Washington-style glaciers in it. And what I'm showing you is over the course of the melt season, the specific discharge. This is a, a, a kind of a cool measurement, but maybe not a familiar term. This is how much water came down the river of that watershed each hour of the melt season per square kilometer of watershed area. So it's normalizing the flow of the river by how big the watershed is so that we can compare one to the other because they're not the same size. But when we look at this plot, we can actually say for instance, right there in the middle of July, that the West Fork, the Glacial Fork, was giving way more water per square kilometer of watershed area than the other one. We could say the West Fork, if you have a hot tub, was better. Okay, it was delivering more water. And during the entire course of the melt season, except for this period of time when the river went crazy and destroyed all our really expensive equipment, 
that was the case, that the glacial river is better at turning precipitation into water in the lake. This is what that plot tells you. The only exception is right at the beginning of the season right there, which is kind of a clue. How come before the melt season really begins, the West Fork, the Glacier Fork, is not doing better? It actually looks in, uh, like, you know, in April or May, May, like they're almost equal. You know, so what's happening in the middle of summer? Well, here's, did someone ask me that question? No, I asked myself. Okay, here's the answer. Here's why. Good question. What we call the deglaciation discharge dividend. Okay, past results are no guarantee of future performance, as we all know. But here's the past, 50 years. Here's the Eklutna Glacier right here. And what I'm going to show you overlaying on this glacier is the elevation change of the glacier surface over roughly 50 years. Bunch of hocus pocus math to figure this out, okay? Where it's really bright red, the glacier in 50 years has lost about 60 meters worth of thickness. That's that long hike to the hut that we've been talking about. Where it's blue, not too many spots blue, maybe gray. If it were blue, that would mean the glacier thickened in 50 years. We don't see much of that. So this glacier has thinned out. We're accustomed to thinking of glacier retreat in terms of the terminus melting backwards. But really, when you're talking about water, what really matters is the thinning of the glacier. That's where all the volume is. And this tells you that the glacier has thinned out a lot. You can convert that thinning to water. How much water does that equal? And then express it in terms that, that people who manage reservoirs are interested in, like acre feet. In 50 years, the glacier lost about a million acre feet worth of ice. If you compare that on a year by year basis, let's say it did it the same every year for 50 years, that's 8%, 8%, of the water that this city has used for electricity and municipal water, hot tubs. So what this means, to be clear, because this is important, is on average for the last 50 years, the time period in which all this infrastructure has been built, the hydropower plant, the water treatment plant, all the pipes in Anchorage, about 8% of the water we've been getting, we've been getting by mining the glacier by actually not just taking the, the snow and rain that fell out of the sky, but taking the ice that fell out of the sky as snow 100 years ago or 200 years ago or something like that. We're mining that glacier. It's shrinking, and that's been giving us extra water. That's the dividend. That's great. That's a nice thing. But what it means is that we're not going to get that water forever, that we only get that water while the glacier shrinks. And that's why... In a warm summer like 2009, why we got why the West Fork was so much better at giving us water, the Glacier Fork was so much more efficient at giving us water than the East Fork, because we were there's a big mine up in the West Fork. We were mining that glacier, and so it was outperforming the East Fork explicitly because of this effect. So as long as that goes on, it's awesome. So, I haven't been looking at the uh, time, but hopefully it's a good time, maybe even past time, to talk about what this all means. This is some students. I had a really tremendous pleasure of, um, my mom came and visited me out in McCarthy this summer. I have a cabin out there. And this gal, Jules, who was a student in this course like seven years ago, I told my, my mom wanted to go rafting. And I was like, yeah, well, we'll go rafting. I'll hire, a, you know, we'll get, we'll get a spot. And we went down and my raft guide was Jewel. So cool, I hadn't seen her in like six years. It was really, really fun. Um, anyway, this is students on the course as a backdrop to what we've learned. Okay, so a Klutna Glacier is shrinking. Point made, hopefully uh, soaking in. 
Klutna Glacier's geometry almost guarantees substantial ongoing shrinkage. I haven't shown you the data to back this up, but even if the climate stops warming, a Klutna Glacier is going to keep shrinking for a, several decades. And that's, that's a, a little bit unique to a Klutna Glacier. But even if you don't believe that, the climate's going to probably keep warming overall. And so it's going to keep shrinking. I didn't talk much about this, but if you uh, are a, enough of a geek to read papers about runoff from glacial rivers, you'll see that in places like the Himalayas and the Andes, dry, dry places, they're really worried about glaciers melting because the rivers that give water to these dry places come from glaciers. And by the middle of the summer, if you don't have a glacier, that river is down to almost nothing. And they're really, really concerned about that. It doesn't really matter here. Because as you all know, midsummer and especially late summer, those of you who came for the terrible weather, <laughs> yep, yep. That's when we get the terrible weather, right? It rains a lot. Our reservoir is not going to go dry because of the melting of a Klutna glacier in the late summer. So we're not worried about that. However, the amount of runoff will diminish. It'll diminish because the deglaciation discharge dividend, which is a hard thing to say after a bourbon, <laughs> will go away as the glacier gets small enough to finally be back in equilibrium with the new climate. So we're not going to get that forever. So what that means is, is that the lake is going to get less water every year from the glacier. Not next year. Actually, we're still in this time period for sure of getting extra water by mining the glacier. But you all know what happens when the mine plays out. That's going to happen with the water. And we won't go dry. It's actually not exactly like a mine, right? Be because it'll still rain and snow in Alaska. But we won't get that bonus from the melting of the glacier. And so the amount of runoff that we see is going to go down. We don't have a super precise estimate of that, but like 10%, 5 or 10%, something like that. That's, you know, if you use every drop, that's a lot. And this isn't something that's going to happen next year. It's going to play out over, you know, the next century. And in, and in fact, beyond, but I, I'm not comfortable telling you anything about that far in the future. So what can we take away from this? What can you re remember from this? Well, I don't know what you can remember, but this is what I'd like you to remember. <laughs> First, glacial runoff in Alaskan glacial rivers is going to be declining in the next few decades because of this effect. And I've been talking about the Eklutna, but um, trivia question number 11, anyone know the name of the really gigantic hydropower project that's proposed for the state of Alaska? Exactly. Trivia question number 12, any glaciers in that watershed? Yes. Okay. So am I here to say that's a good idea, a bad idea? No. Am I here to say that isn't going to work because the glaciers are melting? No. But but certainly as they plan for that and they look at the costs and the benefits, and many of you are well aware, no doubt, of both those things, the benefits they need to take into account, they're not going to be as beneficial in the future as they are now because the amount of water in the Susitna River is going to be less by the amount that those glaciers stop donating old water to the river. That needs to be taken into account. At the most local level, your hot tub will still be full. <laughs> For a couple reasons. One is because it's not going to go dry. The second is even if it did, and it's not going to, remember that the water utility only takes about 11%, I think it was, of the water in the lake. The power company owns the rest. Actually, the power company owns all of it, and the head of MLNP will be happy to tell you that fact. He owns all the water, but, but he's mandated by law to give the first priority to their buyer, which is the water utility. 
So we're not going to run out of water. But as the water, as the runoff declines, the power that we would have made, the hydropower that we would have made with that water, we will make with what? Gas, probably. Natural gas, which is more expensive. And so if there's a consequence locally that is uh, more important to you than the lack of recreation or the, the difference, the changes in recreation opportunities, sea level rise, ecosystem disruption, all the other things that we could care about, it's going to hit you in the pocketbook because our rates will go up as this happens because we're going to have less hydropower available to us from this lake as the, as the runoff diminishes. So it's not a story of catastrophe, but it is a story of one of the many consequences of glacier shrinkage and climate change for our, uh, our humble hamlet here, Anchorage. So that's all. Thanks. Questions? There's time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Would you like another I think I'm probably good. I have, I, have to, I have to go pick up my kids from the sitter. Absolutely. I think it was a statement. Uh, yeah, that, that power generation, there's a double-edged sword to it that as we, if we generate power with natural gas or coal or, or any of the fossil fuels, then, then we're, we're contributing to climate change by putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which contributes to glacier shrinkage. Absolutely true. So, so th there's a little, one of many feedbacks in the climate system is, is this hydropower you know, whatever the negative consequences of hydropower are, which we know about, is clean. It doesn't contribute to climate change. And here we're talking about the hydropower opportunities in the state declining because of glacier shrinkage, which will contribute to more fossil fuel consumption. Yeah, well, too bad. I hope your students uh, will pack all that stuff up and take that away. That, uh, and, you know, maybe even in the future I hope they do too. Oh, she made another comment. I thought I was only supposed to repeat the questions. Yeah. She said she hopes our students uh, take away such messages about fossil fuels and the future and good ways to make the world a better place, if I may paraphrase. Sir. Yeah. So the question was, do I have an idea how far the glacier will retreat before it kind of stabilizes? Um, sort of. You know, it's obviously a hard thing. You know, how much carbon will we emit? How much will the climate warm? How, how will the glacier respond? Those are full of uncertainties. But um, I, I don't know how quickly I can get back to the, the photo of, uh, well, there we go. This is the Eklutna Glacier today. Um, and it gets, it's the, from there down is steep. There's Pitchler's Perch for those that are familiar with it. A graduate student that I'm working with, Louis Sass, thinks that in the next like 100 years, it's realistic to think that the equilibrium terminus position of the Klutna Glacier will be somewhere around there. So way up in the big flat basin that, that is up, you know, from which you can see Whiteout Pass now. So a loss of well over 50% of its surface area, for sure. But, but it, it's, that's very hard to say exactly. Yes? So the question was about the 8% figure that I gave that said 8% of usage over the last 50 years came from shrinkage of the glacier. And, and you're right, it was an average. Um, and, it, and it changes every year because the mass balance changes every year. If you remember, two of the last five years were positive. 
in those years, we actually added a little water to the mine. We, we, we sort of, the glacier grew a little bit. Um, so it, it does vary quite a bit. Um, but as long as the glacier keeps shrinking at, its, at the rate that's been typical of the last 50 years, which I would suggest, if anything, the evidence I see is that it's going to be accelerating. The shrinkage is going to accelerate. Um, we'd expect to see even more. Uh, that number would grow if that were the case. Yeah. No, the 8% applies to the entire reservoir. So that's 8% of, of everything that the city uses, including the hydropower. So, it, it, so basically, you can think of it this way, since we use everything in the lake, 8% of the water going into the lake came from, from mining that glacier. It's a big number, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so the question is whether we've, uh, we've put any energy into studying the gases that are trapped in bubbles in the Eklutna Glacier, since those gases, the gases trapped in any glacier are, uh, and now I'm sort of answering or, or explaining for those of you who, who aren't aware of this, that every glacier, because it starts as snow and gets compressed into ice, it, it encases a sample of the atmosphere into the air bubbles that, you know, there's air and snow as you compress it to ice. It, it, it grabs a little bit of the atmosphere and, and traps it. Um, and so you can look at old glaciers and get those bubbles out and see what the, the atmosphere looked like in the past. And the answer is no, we have not done that on a Klutna. Um, we could, but it's, it's a really valuable technique to, to use that, that study of the trapped gases on ice sheets where the ice itself is in up to 100,000 years old, or, or in some places like in the low accumulation areas of Antarctica, up to a million years old, super valuable information about past atmospheric composition. But the ice on a little glacier like Eklutna, the oldest ice, I don't know exactly, but it would be like a few hundred years old, surprisingly. It's not actually, because it moves, it cycles the ice through pretty quickly, and so that would be a neat thing to do. It would be really educational for the students, but it wouldn't add a lot to our knowledge. It, it's not the best place to do that kind of study. Did you have a second question? Yeah. So the question was why I, I said but didn't justify my argument that the occlutin is going to shrink even if the climate doesn't change much more, and, and why is that? This plot actually shows the reason. That's the terminus of the Eklutna Glacier down there. This is the head of it, the accumulation zone. And a, a very typical way that a glacier would shrink is very little up at the top of the glacier and a lot down at the bottom, which ought to make sense because it's always cold and snowy at the top but it's increasingly warm and inhospitable to glaciers at the lower elevations. So we would expect this lower elevation to be just what it is, very red, maximum thinning. But what's really unusual about the Eklutna is this deep red area right here that's up in that big flat area that, for those of you that have been up there, it's like a big, bigger than a football. It's like as big as Anchorage, it feels like. I mean, it's just this massive flat area in the accumulation zone that is thinning. This is what this shows you right here, actually quite rapidly. That's, that's a lot of thinning. And that's not typical for, a, for most glaciers that the accumulation zone would thin out so much. And we are working on explaining why that's happening, because it's an unusual phenomenon. But um, in the meantime, we know the consequence of that, which is this is the accumulation zone, as the name implies, is where the glacier grows, where it gains mass that it then loses in the ablation zone. And when a glacier's accumulation zone is thinning rapidly, that's like its, you know, that's like its food, you know, and, and so it's eating less, if you want to go with that analogy. 
because of this would be more typical over here, the other branch of the glacier where the thinning is, is more modest. But because it's thinning so rapidly in, in this accumulation zone, it's actually in a position where even with a stable climate, we've been able to show this, it's way out of equilibrium with the climate because it's not eating enough, I guess is the answer. And so um, as long as that continues to happen, it's, it's going to shrink no matter what the climate. And, and I don't know how long that'll keep happening. We're, like I said, we're struggling to understand that. Sir. Yeah. And so my question is, or I guess the, it's first a statement and then a question. The statement is the, the this diagram and this figure is really interesting, but the, the validity of this diagram depends on the quality of your model. Yeah. And in terms of the quality of your model, you mentioned the Appalachian State. And I was wondering what other impact you see as a numerical model besides Appalachian State. Like, do you have weather stations out there, or are yeah. you using remote sensing data, or what else do you have? Yeah, okay, so thank you, great question. Uh, the statement he made, which I 100% agree with, is, is this and any other results we show are only as good as the, the model, and I'd add the data, I think that was implicit in what you said, that the data and the, the sort of an analysis that goes into it, and I didn't show you much of that because of time. Uh, so then his question was, you know, what goes into this? And, and uh, he gave some suggestions. We actually have a, in, into this figure in particular, I can tell you that the, the basis for this is two products. One is the USGS topographic maps that were made in the, in the late 50s in this location. And then uh, a LIDAR flight, which is uh, using a laser underneath a, 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 an aircraft to figure out the elevations of the glacier at, in whatever the date was, 2010, yeah. Um, the LIDAR data is awesome very accurate to within a few centimeters. The map that this require that this depends on, the USGS topographic map does have substantial errors, older technology, particularly in the accumulation zone. Um, in addition, so that's the answer about this. Yes, we have a weather station up there, the ablations. So this doesn't depend, this particular plot doesn't depend on the ablation stake data, the snow pit data, the weather station, but we have all that, and, we're, and some of the other figures I showed you are in there, and they all, they all have errors associated with them. It's a really good thing to point out, and um, the, the slightly less, I hope, less interesting paper that I'm working on with my grad student, Louis Sass, that summarizes all of this, will have a full error analysis in there for, you know, to address that very good question. Sir. So uh, the, the comment was that National Geographic, I didn't see the specific article, but had a, had a recent article showing, uh, describing the amount of sea level rise that would occur if you melted all, all, it sounds like all the ice on the planet, including Antarctica and Greenland, which fortunately, you know, it, in, at least in this century, no one is predicting that it's outside the boundaries of the possible. But, um, but if you did, uh, sea level would rise how much? 216 feet, yeah, so not, not quite 110 meters. Fortunately, we're not predicting that, but it, but it does raise an interesting point, which is that I had a, a student who um, worked with some climate scientists a number of years ago to examine the environmental conditions of a, of a period in the past when the temperatures were similar to what they are now. And they were the kinds of temperatures that are forecast for the next century at that time in the past persisted for many thousands of years. 
And in that period of time, the Greenland ice sheet did essentially, the Antarctic ice sheet persisted, but the Greenland ice sheet essentially went away. And um, sea level rose, I forget the exact number, but many, many tens of meters, which of course would be catastrophic for, for a, great pop, a great portion of the global population. And, and so the, the, the interest, I think the really important point to take from that is when we think about what we're doing to the temperatures and to sea level on this planet, and we see predictions like, you know, half a meter, a meter and a half over the next century, the reason that's a relatively modest number, and not that it's not without consequence, it's, it is with consequence, but the reason that's not tens of meters is only time. It's the only reason that we're not gonna get rid of the Greenland ice sheet in this sex next century is because it takes a long time to melt ice. The temperature conditions that are necessary to get rid of the Greenland ice sheet and create sea level rises comparable to what you're talking about, um, it, it's gonna be warm enough this century. You know, it's only, it's only our fortuitous inability to really predict or give a flying hoot about people 300 years from now that allows us to not worry too much about that. In, in some, the question was, are we the sort of the canary in the coal mine here in Alaska? And, and in some ways, yes. Uh, the Alaska has a lot of ice. You know, outside of Greenland and Antarctica, we have the biggest ice sheet in the world and, and lots of smaller glaciers. So for that reason, people pay attention to us. And also currently, and this won't probably last forever, but currently Alaska, for its size, is the number one contributor to sea level rise. Relative to the size of our ice sheets and glaciers, we are contributing more to, to sea level rise with ice melt than any other place. That probably won't go on forever, but and that can be attributed to a very small number of really just crazy glaciers that are like Columbia Glacier, the recent shrinkage of, of the glaciers in Glacier Bay, a few others like that that are that are off the charts in what they're doing. When though, like when Columbia retreat, Columbia Glacier's retreat settles down a little bit, um, we might not hold that number one. Position. I, I don't know if we should feel bad about that or not. But, but right now, yeah, Alaska's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the question was, does the aspect of a glacier matter if it faces south or north or what have you? Is it, is it likely to behave differently? Uh, aspect definitely matters, especially in Alaska where, you know, I'm guessing everyone in here with a hot tub has a south-facing <laughs> plot of land as well. I think, they, I think they're correlated. North-facing plots are, are um, colder. Certainly, most glaciers in Alaska, they're over, if you look at, the, um, if you take all the glaciers in Alaska and plot their average aspect, it's to the north. That doesn't mean glaciers don't flow south, but the, the, you know, the whole population dominantly flows north. Um, but your question was, do they, are they, do they, that's just sort of where are they? Are they actually melting faster on the north slopes or the south facing slopes? I, I, I think, um, I, I think I'm going to say I'm not sure. It, it, there is some evidence to suggest there might be a pattern. I'm, I think the evidence is a little ambiguous and I'm not familiar enough with it to, to say, but I, uh, so good question, as they say. Yeah. I think it was a good time. Wrap it up. Wrap it up? Okay. <laughs>